Welcome, welcome everybody. We're so happy to see you. Hope everybody had a wonderful summer, wonderful Labor Day. Um, wishing everybody Shana uh, Tova um, Metuka in advance. And uh, I'm going to turn this over to um, Alan Jay, my co-host today, um, who's the executive director of ZOA, who's going to introduce our wonderful speaker, our wonderful featured speaker. Alan. Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, first, a little bit of um, housekeeping. Um, our our guest is Naomi Khan. She'll be speaking for about 20 minutes to a half hour, after which there will be a Q&A. Q&A will be live open mic. So if you want, you can raise your hand or use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, founded in 2006, Rigabim is a public Israeli movement dedicated to preserving state lands by promoting Zionist land policy. Naomi Khan, director of the International Division of Rigavim, is no stranger to ZOA. Over the course of the past few years, ZOA and Rigavim have done a number of webinars together, and Naomi and Rigavim always make time to take the ZOA leadership mission uh, to Israel on a tour to expose the illegal Arab building and illegal Bedouin lag grabs in Area C, largely funded by European money, European Union money. <clears throat> This past June, Naomi took our group to see the illegal building and illegal tapping into water and utilities at Khan al Ahmar, just off the Kfar Adumim Junction near Amali Adumim, which is a glaring example of Israel's compromised security in the very area that acts as a buffer of first line defense for Jerusalem from her enemies in the east. I see a lot of parallels between ZOA and Rigavim. On our side of the pond, ZOA often stands alone on issues like systemic anti <clears throat> sorry like systemic anti-semitism fomented by the progressive left including ethnic studies curricula and critical race theory like challenging hostile to Israel and to the Jewish people lawmakers like Ocasio Cortez Omar Tlaib and Presley and hostile to Israel Biden appoint appointees the latest of whom Jack Lew being considered for US ambassador to Israel is a throwback from the most hostile to Israel Obama administration, like fighting anti-Semitic programming on college campuses, like the upcoming anti-Semitic conference to be held at the University of Pennsylvania and vile anti-Semitic graduation speeches at places like CUNY. Like ZOA, Rigavim does the hard work that others simply will not. You challenge the illegal land grabs and fight the otherwise tolerated financing by the EU, and the constant vilification of Israel by the UN and its affiliates like UNRWA. Bedouistan, written by Mayor Deutsch, the Director General of Rigavim, is not an easy book to read, but it should be on every Zionist's reading list. Naomi, we're honored to have you back, and we're eager once again to learn from you. Please tell us about the book and about illegal building in Area C. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is a, a fabulous opportunity for me to uh, introduce, um, give a taste really of what it is that we do. The book that we're going to be discussing this evening is essentially um, a narrative form that uh, tries to bring the uh, information that and the policy mm -hmm. initiatives that we have developed over 17 years uh, to readers across the world, English language readers and Hebrew, of course, um, to make all of the data and all of the legalese and all of the um, policy papers in a very, very technical uh, language accessible and understandable to people who have anything from zero to 100% uh, grasp of the Negev. There is not anyone who uh, reads Rigavim's reports, and I'm talking about people who served as ministers for Bedouin affairs, uh, prime ministers, um, and people who are residents of the Negev, there is not one person who reads our reports who doesn't come away having learned something new because we are actually recognized as the foremost experts on the Negev. So this is a fantastic opportunity to talk about a book that is really designed uh, to bring all this information to the public. So Bedouistan was written by Mayor Deutsch. It is, it is spoken in his voice but it is the culmination of years of teamwork, uh, field work by field coordinators who are out in the field in the Negev every day, 
uh, investigating, documenting, researching, reporting on, and often preparing uh, the all of the necessary materials for prosecution of abuse of Israel's land resources. This is precisely what we do throughout the country. So what, uh, what you mentioned, Alan, uh, in terms of Area C, in terms of Judea and Samaria, is precisely the same methodology and the same uh, agenda that we have everywhere else in the country, including the Negev and the Galilee. And hopefully soon we will be uh, applying our methods in Jerusalem proper, which we have not done to date simply for lack of resources. We're hoping to move in that direction in the very uh, near future as well. So um, I'm going to uh, describe how we collected all the information for this book, Bedouistan. And then it's going to be very, it's a very depressing book. It's a very depressing read. The situation in the Negev uh, is out of control. I don't think there's anyone who disagrees with that anymore. It took us years to convince people that it was happening, that it was coming, that it was an inevitable, complete erasure of Israeli sovereignty that we were going to see. And unfortunately, that... Those chickens have come home to roost, uh, and the entire country was taken aback in 2021 when the Palestinian riots spilled over into the Negev. There was a massive identification of Israeli Bedouin citizens with the Palestinian rioters uh, in Judea and Samaria. Those borders were erased, and Israeli sovereignty, uh, law enforcement were nowhere to be seen. Um, people began to ask, how did that happen? How did we arrive in this situation? And they turned to the experts, and the experts are uh, Rigovim, and particularly Mayor Deutsch. Just a very brief uh, biographical note, Mayor uh, came to be a co-founder of Rigovim after having served as an officer in the IDF in the Givati Reconnaissance Brigade that was in charge of patrolling smuggling routes being used uh, by Bedouin clans to bring, at first, only only things like uh, drugs, uh, women, cigarettes, all kinds of contraband from the Gaza area through into Judea and Samaria and further north, going towards uh, Egypt, going towards Lebanon and Syria. Uh, eventually, the IDF began to understand when it is started intercepting in the smuggling uh, these, along these smuggling trails, started intercepting weapons. And there was actually a missile that they uh, managed to um, get, get to capture. The IDF managed to find it before it was actually launched. It was aimed right at Ben Gurion Airport. So the IDF at a certain point understood that what they had, uh, that, that, that the situation of non enforcement of the law in civilian matters had spilled over and become a serious security threat to the state of Israel. Um, and we saw what Mayor Deutsch saw when he was an officer uh, in charge of patrolling these routes is uh, saw the future, saw what was going to happen, saw how in 2006 uh, what he was seeing were the seeds that came into full bloom in 2021, when the highways of the Negev were blocked, Jewish communities were uh, under siege by their neighbors, uh, also citizens of the state of Israel with full and equal rights. Uh, and, and the situation simply had to, the, it, the government had to finally admit that it had lost control of the Negev. So Bedouistan describes how this situation has was born, um, and more important work that we do, I believe, aside from collecting the data and impressing the situation, the reality on the ground upon our legislators and upon the public is we don't just stop there. We, in everything that we do, we also come up with solutions, practical solutions for these massive challenges to Israel's sovereignty that are expressed through the erosion of Zionist land use policy. So I'd like to um, show a couple of slides that will give a very brief introduction in a much more technical way to some of the things that are discussed uh, in a narrative form in Bedouistan. And I think uh, this will show how the basis, the basis for creating this narrative work is really 
fact, and law. So I'm going to uh, share my screen with you for a moment, I hope. Here we are. Yes. And uh, again, uh, this is just a very brief statement of Rigavim's uh, mission. We protect Israel's resources by uh, in empowering the government of Israel to uh, bring Zionism back into public policy. We call for, in all cases, equal universal law enforcement. And when the law is insufficient to protect our rights uh, and our land resources, then we propose legislative amendments or legislation in general, primary legislation, to address those holes in our system. This, again, is our mission statement. Um, and so what we do is collect data, collect the dots, write policy papers, present them to members of parliament, the Knesset, encourage them to learn about the facts on the ground. And then we go to the next step. We take them out into the field to see what it is that we see. Uh, we try to educate and expose them to the realities that we've found through our fieldwork and our research. And then we propose solutions. We work with them to uh, further the legislative process in any of the areas that we find lacking. All of these are, by the way, uh, covers to some of our more recent reports. All of them are available full text and downloadable on our website. Uh, if there's any particular uh, issue or topic here that you'd like to learn more about, our website is completely open source. But what the, what the book focuses on in, to a very great extent is this map. The map that you see before you is a map of ownership claims. The Bedouin, uh, it, Israeli Bedouin citizens of the Negev uh, were allowed, were encouraged actually, to present any proof of ownership of land to the go government of Israel in order to, for that land to be registered to their ownership. Uh, this began in 1971 and the, uh, the roles were left open for 10 years uh, some 3,320 ownership claims were submitted. Not one of them has ever been found to have any factual or legal validity. But what you see here is all of the land of the Negev that is covered by these ownership claims. And the state of Israel has not managed to resolve these claims in any way uh, or to any significant degree. Only, a pro only 20% of these claims have been resolved in the decades since they were first presented. So Rigavim has analyzed what these, what is behind these claims, what their validity is, what the government of Israel should do to resolve them, and how all the land that is now claimed by the Bedouin can be actually reclaimed by the state, because it is all state land, and used to the advantage of all citizens of Israel for future growth, development, for infrastructure uh, infrastructure projects, and to protect Israel's um, national interest on, on every front. So among the things that we do is this, again, as I mentioned, uh, the what you see here in this graph, the outstanding claims far out, outweigh the claims that have already been resolved one way or another. Uh, and that is a situation that is absolutely untenable and is causing uh, further and further uh, deepening of the conflict between the Bedouin and the state of Israel. Another thing that we have uh, tried very, very hard to bring to public awareness, and we've had quite a lot of success, there are some very, very important legislative amendments um, made recently, uh, is the practice of polygamy among the Bedouin sector. We touch upon it in this book. We have a full report on it, and our report actually spurred the government to face this issue for the first time in 70 years. Uh, this issue is a massive problem, not only on a humanitarian level and on a social level for, the Bedouin, for Bedouin society itself, it is also a massive security problem because the importation of women to support the polygamy industry, which is exactly what it is, um, means that there are thousands and thousands of illegal aliens, illegal women, Palestinian women who are bought and sold, smuggled into the Negev, and are uh, mothering children 
uh, for which the state of Israel pays massive, massive benefits and gives them free land. So this is changing the whole map of the Negev, and it is illegal. It is completely illegal, has been illegal in the state of Israel since the state's inception. Uh, the law against polygamy was, is on the books since 1950. So we, this is another one of the issues that have arisen from our analysis of the situation on the ground in the Negev. Again, we track uh, our research, the things that go behind this narrative in uh, Bedouistan uh, are a combination of fieldwork and what you see here uh, is the other half of our work, and that is research. We collect data from open sources. We petition the government. Often we have to sue the government in order to get data regarding population, regarding uh, government investment, regarding enforcement of the law. Uh, and we can see from our research, we're the only ones who put all of this together and present it as a global picture. Uh, and the picture that emerges is shocking and requires, requires that the state of Israel address it immediately. Unfortunately, the state of Israel really had no clue how to do that. So we presented more and more information. This is information, for example, we go out into the field and we count every single structure on the ground. We research them and see what is legal, what has permits, what does not. And we track the expansion of illegal construction uh, and map it out to see what its strategic implications are. All of this information, um, we then take the most important step in my opinion, and that is we create policy initiatives to solve these problems. Anyone who wants to see our, uh, so our solutions, what we recommended to the previous government and what we've been uh, trying to promote for years, it can go onto our website and look at this report. It's actually a PowerPoint presentation very specific step-by-step -step, uh, action that the government can take to resolve this decades old and growing problem. In fact, we presented this uh, policy initiative to all the members of Knesset and one took particular interest. He came out to the field with us over and over. He came to our offices to learn what we know about the Negev to thresh out all of the solutions that we have recommended. And when this government was elected, he was the only person who actually asked to be given responsibility for this tremendously complex issue uh, and asked for responsibility for the Bedouin Authority. His name is Amichai Shikli. He is uh, a Likud legislator. He is the minister of, uh, of um, diaspora relations, as well as the minister in charge of the Bedou Bedouin Authority. He learned our stable care initiative um, in depth. And he has now launched the new government plan and initiative and legislation and budgeting and everything else to deal with the Negev. His program is based, approximately 85% of it is based on our policy recommendations and the things that he learned by uh, sitting down with us and going through all of our research and all of our, uh, all of our work that we have accumulated over 17 years. So we're very hopeful that things will begin to change. Uh, anyone who wants to learn more about how we can solve these incredibly complex problems, are, you're invited to look at the Stable Care Initiative on our website. Uh, just an example. Why is this not moving forward? Let's move it forward. Here we are. Uh, the Stable Care Initiative divided up the problems that are discussed into Bedouistan uh, into three main categories and address them with step-by-step -step specific action, uh, legislation, areas uh, that required further budgeting or reallocation, redistribution of existing resources. So all of this um, is now actually really in large part has been adopted almost lock, stock and barrel by the government minister who is in charge of the Bedouin Authority. Uh, and we are seeing change on the ground. So we're, we're, we're quite hopeful that this will gain momentum. Um, I, will, I will end my remarks uh, without having said anything about the actual book itself by encouraging everyone who's watching to learn more about the Negev because the Negev, even for Israelis, is kind of the neglected backyard. And that is how in large part 
the very, very problematic situation that we're facing today has developed because people aren't aware and all of this has been gaining in size, weight, and um, menacing violence uh, over years of neglect and simply turning the other way. The more people are aware of what's happening in the Negev, the more people are aware of what needs to happen in the Negev, the faster it will happen and the better chance we have of maintaining Israel's control of the Negev. I would point out that the Negev is 60% of Israel's land mass. So it's not just a small amount of area that we can ignore. The only place left for the state of Israel to grow, to develop, to build new communities for our children and grandchildren, to create a better life for all of Israel's citizens, to become what it can be, the powerhouse in terms of energy, renewable resources, uh, desert agriculture, all of these things, the key is in the Negev. And the fact that Israel can is watching the Negev slip between its fingers cannot go on. So I open the floor to you, to your questions, comments. Um, those of you who have read the book, those of you who haven't read the book, uh, I'm eager to hear how someone who's not totally immersed in all of this, as I have become, um, found reading Bedouistan. I'd love to hear your impressions and answer any questions you have. Naomi, can I suggest Thanks. that you stop sharing your screen? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to try. Let's see. Uh, stop share. Yes, there we are. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Naomi, for that. Uh, uh, and for that really wonderful presentation and overview. Um, thank you. And, you know, we'll turn to the questions. If you have a question, um, please either um, you can either write it into the chat or into the Q&A button or um, raise your hand and we'll try to call on you so that you can ask your question live. Um, or I wanted to turn it over to Alan for just a minute. I think he has an announcement or two. What I'd like, first of all, Naomi, thank you so much. Let me also um, thank our colleague, Jackie Schaefer, for running the, the, web, the webinar for us. She's on the back end, always making sure that we're seamless. So thank you, Jackie. Uh, Naomi, I do have a question, but before I before I ask that question, I'd like to wish everybody on this webinar a healthy, safe, and sweet Jewish New Year. Shana Tova Umetuka, may you all be inscribed for good. Uh, if you haven't already, or even if you have, please consider a generous gift to help ZOA continue to be the clarion voice, advocating for Israel's legal sovereign rights and for defending Jews the world over from the evils of anti-Semitism. Jackie, if you can, would you put a link two links for me, one to our donation page and one to Regavim's website so that people can navigate to Naomi's website. Um, ZOA is 100% donation funded, so please help. Give your high holiday gift. We do need your help. Um, and Liz, if it's okay with you, can I ask the first question of Naomi? Um, sure. <laughs> okay, thanks. Naomi, not this past year, but two years ago when we were in Israel as part of the ZOA leadership mission to Israel, we actually did visit with the Tzeli military base. Uh, it was an amazing base, an amazing visit. The We were with Brigadier General Amir Avivi, right? So we get into the base with not big problem. We um, we saw what we believe was a, a relatively um, a secretive presentation. Even for us, under General Avivi's guidance, it took us 20 minutes to exit the base. Yes. So for those who haven't read the book, um, Mayor, Mr. Deutsch, Mayor illustrates that much of the negative is like the wild, wild west. <laughs> and he he talks about the Bedouins actually stealing munitions and military things from the base. And Naomi, there is one confusion for me. Why does Israel allow that to continue? Why is that not stopped. Israel is one of the most powerful militaries in the world. So before I answer your question, to the best of my ability, I'll, I'll make the question even sharper and paint the picture even darker, because the bases in the Negev uh, are the main cultivation ground for illegal, for the illegal drug trade in Israel. The Tzelim base and the Nevatim base in the Negev have 
extensive training grounds. Yes, they call them firing zones, live fire drills, maneuvers, all the things that an army needs to do to keep its soldiers uh, in fighting form. These are very large, empty spaces, and the Bedouin are actually using these empty spaces to grow and to produce illegal drugs. It's a massive illegal trade that is happening right under the nose of the IDF. In addition to the theft of uh, weapons, ammunition, these bases host thousands and thousands of Israeli citizens who serve in reserves duty. These reserve soldiers come for a few days of training and all of their possessions are stolen. While they're out in the field doing their maneuvers and practicing to defend the country, Israeli citizens, Bedouin Israeli citizens, go into the tents and steal everything. Now, I won't say only things that are, anything that's not nailed down because they steal things that are nailed down. To the point there that once in a while, the police will go on a raid into one of these uh, Bedouin squatters camps that surround the IDF bases, and they'll re reclaim jeeps. I'm not talking about small things, parts of airplanes, thousands and thousands and thousands of rounds of ammunition, hand grenades, all of these things make their way into the hands of our most serious enemies. We are these th this illegal trade, these crime families that have essentially taken over the Negev are fueling um, the murder of Israelis and the Israelis themselves. We have a very, very serious problem because there is no law enforcement. The state of Israel has always been afraid to be accused of racism and will do things that are absolutely insane, such as not, uh, not uh, enforce the law against polygamy in the Bedouin sector. However, the Bedouin, Bedouin population of the Negev is the fastest growing population on the planet Earth. And more than 70% of it, uh, all income in that sector comes from government handouts of one kind or another. We are essentially paying the Bedouin to take four, five, six, seven wives and have dozens, and I don't mean only dozens, some of them have up to 100 children. They don't know their names. They don't care. These children are raised uh, as a means of milking the system for more and more uh, welfare payments and free land, which the government gives to Bedouin only. And um, these children are raised as disenfranchised um, and angry citizens who are whose mothers are Palestinians. They are products of an anti-Israel indoctrination in their education system. They do not identify with the state of Israel. They are hostile to our, to our values and to our existence. And we are essentially paying for this. So how is all this happening? Why is the Israeli government not stopping it? The answer is built in. The answer is uh, Israel has a lot of uh, balls in the air, juggling a lot of um, a lot of international scrutiny, uh, a lot of international pressure, and has always been wary of alienating Bedouin Israeli citizens because we want to have a multifaceted society. We want to extend equal rights to all of the peoples living in our in our country. Um, we have succeeded, I believe, to a much greater extent with the Druze community. Um, but giving equal rights without equal responsibilities is a recipe for disaster. And that is how the state of Israel has treated the Bedouin of the Negev for far too long. What we are calling for is not only equal rights, but also equal responsibilities before the law. And we're working very hard to see that that actually starts to happen. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Very, very frightening situation. Um, here's a question from Alan Kramer. Uh, how do you, how do we get a copy of the book? I still couldn't find the link myself. <laughs> so if you go on the, the book, uh, as opposed to everything else that we do, all of our reports and policy papers, the book was not put up on our website in full downloadable text. 
because we crowdsourced it and we are selling it in order to make back the production costs. Uh, like ZOA, Rigovim is 100% donation funded and we are uh, we cover the entire country and we cover every single policy issue that arises from our land use and Zionist land, Z Zionist land use uh, agenda. And we're all together 11 people. So in order for us to do what we do, we needed to, 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 pu to publish this book, which is so different than our other reports. Uh, we are, we're offering it for sale. If you go onto the Rigovim website and look at the very top row, the top menu, you will see the word Bedouistan, click on that. And there's an order form uh, and you can order the book and we will send it your way by express mail. Great. Thank you. you sure. Very important question in a book club. Indeed. <laughs> um, then, then we have, um, are you going to sell it on Amazon also? or, or uh... I don't believe that that has happened. I can look into it, actually. Um, I don't know how that works, honestly. It's uh, okay. out of my, beyond my purview at this point, but I will ask the publisher if that is an option. I don't know exactly how that works, but I'll I'll certainly look into it if that will make things easier. Okay, because I think a lot of people might look there, you know, for the book. Um, okay. okay, then we have um, two very good questions from Donald Lewin um, that he's placed in the chat. Um, the first one is, what are the differences uh, uh, between Bedouins and Palestinians? That's the first. And the second is, what are the aims of the Bedouins, which I guess you've sort of touched on a lot. It's a very interesting thing. Only in recent years, there has been, because of the practice of polygamy and other external factors, the the influx of, of uh, Qatari money and Palestinian authority influence in the Negev, only in the last few years, the Bedouin population has begun to identify itself as Palestinian. That was never the case before. There was no such thing. As a matter of fact, the Bedouin had absolutely nothing to do with that whole narrative. They, they did not consider themselves part of the Arab nation. They are a completely separate thing. They have their tribal structure. They come from uh, the Arabian Peninsula. They arrived in the state of Israel approximately 180 years ago for the first time. Um, and they have a very different setup. It's a completely different thing. So very often, and I think Alan can attest to it, when you go around uh, and you look at Palestinian Authority cities uh, or villages in areas A and B, all around the outskirts of them, you will see these Bedouin encampments. And why are they not living inside the cities and villages where there are proper uh, facilities available? Because the Arabs, the, the Palestinian, quote unquote, the, the, the indigenous Arabs and the Bedouin don't live together. They don't consider themselves part of the same nation, or they haven't until recently. Uh, so they're they're very very different. Um, unfortunately, those lines for political expediency are now being purposefully blurred or even erased. And through the demographic pressures that are created by all of these Palestinian women being brought into the Negev uh, for the practice of polygamy. Demographically, the, the population is changing. At the present moment, the last time that we actually conducted a census of this, over 20% of the Bedouin of the Negev, quote unquote, aren't actually Bedouin. They're Palestinian women and their children. So this is changing rapidly. It is radicalizing the community, both term, in terms of identification and culture and in terms of the, the narrative and the political affiliation. And it's a very, very serious uh, issue that the state of Israel, although it finds it, Israel has never um, voluntarily involved itself in these types of issues in terms of getting, getting rolling up its sleeves and trying to sort out Arab society uh, because we have enough problems on our head. <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's a very serious political issue at this point and a very serious strategic and security issue. We're going to have to address it. So yes, there is a huge difference between Bedouin and Arab. They don't live together. They don't want to live together in general. Uh, those things are now in flux for all the wrong reasons. Thank you. And, and what are the goals of the oh, Bedouin? The, goals of the, Bedouin, the right. goals of the Bedouin have always been the same. Um, power. Uh, Bedouin 
have more wives and more children and have a history, a long bloody history, which is documented all over the world, uh, wherever they lived, and was very carefully studied by uh, uh, academics who, um, sociologists, political scientists, historians, the, the history of the Bedouin is a history of tribal wars for control of resources. So what is the goal of the Bedouin with all of this illegal construction down in the Negev today? It is the same as it always has been, and that is to control more territory, to have more land, uh, which makes you more powerful. That is it. Thank you. Um, then we have a question from Ronald Scheinson. Um, he asks, how um, differentiable are the various Bedouin tribes? I have oh. spent, and he said he spent time with uh, a um, somebody who was a, a Bedouin, an Israeli Bedouin, who was an mm -hmm. IDF general. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, in how, the north, in the north. how distinguishable are they? Ah, so Bedouin in the north and Bedouin in the south are very, very different to the point where a few years ago, the Bedouin communities themselves tried to resolve those differences because they are actually family. They're parts of the same tribes, but their cultural experience, their everyday experience, their history over the last several decades has driven them very, in very, very different directions. Bedouin in the north of the country own a significant uh, portion of the privately owned land in the state of Israel. They live in organized communities. Um, they serve in the IDF in much higher percentages. And this is what should have and could have happened down in the Negev, but has not, um, to the point where we all grew up on this, on this same narrative. The Bedouin are loyal citizens in the state of Israel, and they serve in the IDF. I would put this question to you, and I will answer it for you. What is the percentage of conscription among eligible Bedouin in the Negev to the IDF? And unfortunately, the answer will shock you, but the answer is it's less than 1% at the present time. And the percentages are not improving simply because, as I said, the children of Palestinian uh, mothers who were brought in for polygamous marriages do not identify with the state, have no interest in going to battle against the rest of their family, which is either in Gaza or in uh, Hebron or in or anywhere else in these Palestinian Authority controlled areas. So, for example, Ismail Hania, the head of Hamas in Gaza, has two sisters who live in Israel, in the Negev. They are married to an Israeli Bedouin citizen. They have received citizenship, their children have received citizenship and their children are eligible for the draft. And of course, I don't expect them to go signing up voluntarily to fight against their uncle Ismail uh, down at the border. So we're creating a time bomb here. And again, this is the fastest growing population on earth. It doubles in size every 15 years, uh, simply through the practice of polygamy. And the state of Israel has to rein this in. Enforcing the law will, I think, prevent any further slide or erosion of the cohesion of Israeli society that is happening before our eyes um, as all of these foreign pressures are being imported into the Negev. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Oh, I'll just add one more thing about the tribes and you can read any of our uh, reports, particularly um, our most recent report called The Vanishing Negev. Uh, the tribes take great pride in self-identification. You look at a person's ID papers and you know exactly what tribe he's from. Uh, there are tribes, there are sub-tribes, and there are meta-tribes. They are uh, coalitions of certain tribes that do get along and other tribes that don't get along, and they have all their warfare that way, and they can't live in the same areas if they're not in the right coalition. And it's an extremely complex thing, but very, very easy to track because no one's, it's it's a point of pride uh, and familial and social organization in the Bedouin sector and will determine quite a lot of things about your life, depending on what tribe you were born into. Thank you. And uh, you, you, Kitson has a question and actually relates to a question I was going to ask. I was going to ask you to 
tell us what your background, you know, we discussed it before, but to tell everybody what your background is, um, you bet your screen. Um, yeah. And uh, you Kitson is asking, could you tell us what influence the Supreme Court has in this problem with the net with the better one? Okay, so I'll start from the beginning. First of all, the background of my screen, my screensaver here, is a, an aerial photo that we took. Our field coordinator put up a drone at the recent pro-government, uh, pro-judicial reform rally that we co-sponsored. And what you see there on the ground are tens and tens of thousands of Israelis who came out in support of the government. Unfortunately, that gets very, very underreported in foreign media and in Israeli media, and they only report on the anarchists who are holding up highways and uh, terrorizing members of parliament and their families and all that sort of thing. But there we have co-sponsored a number of pro-government, pro-judicial uh, reform rallies that have brought out depending on who you ask, anywhere from 80 to 300,000 people uh, in support of the government's um, reform and reigning in of the runaway Supreme Court. What, what has the Supreme Court done in terms of Bedouistan? The Supreme Court, in terms of the things that we are talking about, has been part of the problem and not part of the solution. So, for example, the Supreme Court has overruled government legislation, and has forced the government of Israel to provide all sorts of services and infrastructure to people living illegally, squatting on state land. So the government required the state of is the Supreme Court, excuse me, the Supreme Court required the state of Israel to provide water, to pave roads and build schools and health clinics in illegal squatters camps that where there are people who are stealing either government or privately owned land. Uh, and the Supreme Court simply has its own agenda here. And that agenda is fueling the problem and discouraging people from actually living legally, coming to a compromise with the state, um, re, uh, resolving their ownership claims and moving into legal communities so that the, the state can reclaim all the land that is being covered at the moment by squatters. Yes, the Supreme Court has a very active role here, and it's not a good one. Although, two weeks ago, we had a very, very important judgment that wasn't the Supreme Court. It was the Beersheba District Court. I encourage you to look on our website about it. Uh, it's a case that we've been in court with for a very long time. And finally, finally, uh, Jewish private ownership has been uh, respected and will be restored to a very large, uh, to a, a, a Jewish family whose property has been squatted on for decades. Oh, that's, that's great. Wonderful yes. to hear that. Yes. Um, then we have uh, Stephen Gerzoff, uh, Dr. Stephen Gerzoff asking, do these Bedouin women and children get their medical care in, the Be in Beersheba at the Soroka Medical Center? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. It's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, and there are many sides to it. I can tell you on the one hand that Soroka Hospital has what you would call in America a don't ask, don't tell policy. That is, when a, when a Bedouin uh, husband and wife show up at the hospital and she comes in with an identity card, a Tudat Zehut, uh, to come in and have a baby, they don't ask questions and they take care of her, obviously, give her all advanced medical care, everything that is necessary. Um, the problem is, if something goes a little off schedule and this woman needs a blood transfusion and her tudat zehut and her identity and her medical records all say that she has a certain blood type, but it's actually not the person whose identity card was presented, it's someone else, uh, because she is illegal and a Palestinian, and the identity card that was uh, handed in is the identity card of the first Bedouin wife. So they have different blood types, and people are dying from these sorts of things all the time. On the other hand, the state of Israel has no interest in increased infant mortality. It has no increased in uh, interest in, in increased maternal mortality. It doesn't want to discourage these illegal um, Bedouin wives in polygamous families from coming to the hospital for medical treatment. We don't want to become a third world country. So they don't ask, 
and most of the time they don't tell. Um, but it is clear when a woman comes in for the fourth time in the same year to have a baby <laughs> that somebody's passing around identity papers and medical records so that they can get medical treatment for more than one wife. Um, and again, one hand in the Israeli system doesn't speak to the other because the hospital is not the police and the police are not the hospital. We don't want people not to come to the hospital, but at some point, somebody's going to apply for citizenship. Someone's going to apply for benefits. Someone's going to apply for social security or Israel's equivalent. Someone's going to apply for a welfare stipend and for child allowance for these new babies. So the Israel, um, what do you call it in English? Essentially our social security system, the Israel um, knows who's getting these stipends, right? But they won't report it to the police that this that this one household has 85 children. Um, the Ministry of Education knows how many children are sitting in classrooms, but they won't report it to the police because they have a whole separate thing. They know, you know, can you imagine a parent teacher's night where I had a problem when I had three school age children, but when you have 87 or 88, it's a part, it's a bit of a challenge. The schools know exactly who's who. The schools know exactly who the parents are and who is half siblings with whom. All of this is don't ask, don't tell. It is time for the state of Israel not only to ask, but to demand that the authorities take responsibility for the Negev as they do everywhere else. There's a massive industry of fraud. There's a massive industry of uh, subterfuge that is costing people their lives. And we are allowing a state within a state, the state of Bedouistan, to be funded by the state of Israel. That has to stop. I agree. Um, thank you. Um, then we have a um, question from Robert, uh, Robin Gutman. Um, she says, uh, or he, I don't know. <laughs> um, Israel has taken the approach of destroying homes in the West Bank when terrorism is involved. Why not illegal Bedouin structures? Also, how is security for Jewish towns in the Negev harmed? Na Naomi, can I jump in for one minute? Because I think it, it dovetails with this question. Uh, again, when we visited, you showed us, um, you showed us a uh, building, uh, Arab building in Area C, and you explained to us that many of the structures remain unfinished on purpose. Yes. And I think it would behoove uh, the answer to this question if you could tell us why. And there's one other thing that you so, that you briefly touched on that I think is so important, that uh, some Bedouin towns are very well established in Arab towns. And are these people paying their taxes like my family in Ranana and Alon and Aleish and wherever they live? Um, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, the situation with demolitions, I'll go back to the first question that Liz posed. The situation with demolitions, um, having nothing to do with terrorism, a state, any state, anywhere in the world uh, that has a planning and building law that wants structures to be safe uh, and wants them to be built in a way that is forward thinking and makes good use of uh, our limited resources that will allow for future development uh, has a planning and building law. When someone builds a house without a permit, which means no oversight, no oversight of the materials going into it, no oversight of where it's being built and what the repercussions will be for future development, no, not when that when those permits aren't issued, the state has not only the right, but the responsibility to tear the structure down. It doesn't have to have anything to do with terrorism. In fact, it should never get to that point. We want to live in a, in a, in a country that is ruled by law. We don't wanna live in the wild west. We don't wanna live in a, a might makes right, whoever grabs a piece of land, it becomes his. That is a recipe for not never ending conflict. We don't want that to happen. We want the government to enforce the law. So one of the things that we worked for for a very long time and finally achieved is the appointment of a specialized 
police unit in charge of enforcement of the planning and building code uh, for protecting both the open spaces and the future development of the Negev. It's called the Green Patrol, essentially. Uh, and we are hoping that a similar thing will be done in Judea and Samaria to protect the, uh, the open spaces there as well. It's one of our core recommendations. Um, there are demolitions that are carried out in uh, it, but far too little, far too late. Uh, and in many, many cases, what the state of Israel has claimed is that they cannot go into these squatters camps in the Negev and the the, the regular uh, authorities that are responsible for demolition are afraid to go in because we're talking about extremely violent and dangerous communities. Uh, and they have are, they are afraid that officers of the law will lose their lives. So you have to go in with a massive force. I believe, um, and I think it's a proven fact, that if you go in with a, a massive force once, twice, and three times, by the fourth time, they will understand that the state of Israel is finally serious about protecting its land resources and enforcing the law for a better future for everyone. I would like to just add one thing. I don't want it to come off as if I am painting the entire Bedouin community with the same brush. I am certainly not. 80% of the Bedouin in the Negev live legally inside legal all Bedouin towns or villages in the Negev, either urban or rural communities that were created by the state of Israel for the Bedouin so that they could maintain their distinct heritage and lifestyle. 80% uh, of, the, of the Bedouin community are living legally. The 20% that are not is growing at a faster rate than the rest and is terrorizing the rest. The main victims of the lawlessness in the Negev, the rampant uh, drug trade, the violence, the shootings, the wild driving on the roads, all of these things, the main victims are the Bedouin who live in the legal communities. Uh, they are, their lives are unlivable and the state of Israel has a responsibility to them as well. Now, I can tell you that the Jewish communities in the Negev, you asked, one of the questions was, how, how are they impacted? There's one Jewish community in the Negev called Omer. It's a very beautiful community. It's a very well-established community, very, very um, intellectual community, really. There are judges and lawyers and high-tech people and all sorts of whatever, um, and IDF officers and a Jewish, very beautiful Jewish community down in the Negev. They actually, in addition to their police force, uh, to the regular police force and this green patrol, they have to hire a private company to add protection. And they had to eventually dig a moat. I'm, I kid you not. They have, aside from gates and cameras and patrols and armed guards and police and even the army, they had to dig a moat around the community because the level of theft and home invasions and attacks was so unbearable that they tried to figure out a way to keep people out. Uh, and they had to build a physical, physically had to dig a trench around the entire place. Uh, this, the same, unfortunately, is true of the Nevatim base. They had to dig a moat around the base to keep the Bedouin from driving off, not only in private cars of the reservists who were serving, but in army vehicles, armored carriers, jeeps, command cars. They were just driving them off the base. They come, they take the targets off of the practice, the firing ranges. They take all of these things. They come with, you know, vehicles of their own and just cart off whole chunks of IDF material. So the base now has a moat around it. The situation is out of hand uh, and has to be reined in. So I hope I've addressed all those questions. No, oh, thank you. Uh, we have another question about uh, uh, purchasing the book. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, the same person who was trying to buy the book, I guess, tried to um, <laughs> press the bit, uh, you know, the bit of a stand uh, link. Yes. link, and and what happened was it just took him to a donate page. So, uh, so guess... that was the only way that we could work it out because we have no other way of issuing receipts uh, in the United States. So it will show up as a donation, but that it's a specific donation to Bedouistan. 
so it will fund this book um but in any case i would be happy to just send my email anyone who wants to purchase it can just send me their details and i will be in touch and we can work it out uh one by one anyone who's having problems with the link on the website uh, in good. general i'd be happy uh jackie if you would put up my email anyone who has questions that we won't have time to address or comments or anything else i urge you to drop me an email and i try to respond in a timely fashion now with all the holidays coming up there are going to be gaps but i try to get to all of the questions that are raised uh, sometimes the questions uh, are those light bulb moments when someone asks a question that, from an angle that we have not considered all of a sudden wow and we go <laughs> running off into a whole new direction of research and uh, policy formulation so bring on your questions bring them on we welcome them all Okay, um, I'm just going to read um, the last three questions and comments that I see because we're running out of time and you can answer all or any um, and, uh, you know, in the next few minutes and then we'll, I guess we'll sign off and say goodbye and shana tova to everybody. Um, Alan may want to say a word also. Um, David Jacobs is just sending you a thank you. He, he, wants to, he says, I'd like to thank Liz and Alan and ZOA for inviting Naomi to speak to the ZOA book club. And, you know, we, we, we thank you like for, very much for coming. Thing. um and thank you david uh alan kramer um asks um didn't the government stop payments for multiple children of israelis if so why haven't payments stopped for multiple children of bedouins um and then um steve gerzoff um asks um he says he was in, in Beersheba three years ago and found a case of a first wife who was being abused by her Bedouin husband and she came to the Soroka Medical Center to meet with a social worker but needed to be quote supervised uh by a male of the community so she was accompanied by her 10 year old son of the husband's second wife um, yes. you know, if you'd like <laughs> to comment on on this you know, idea that women yes. have to be supervised yes um uh yeah, then I guess we well, David also asked David Jacobs about, you know, what else can be done to stop the Bedouin from taking over the Negev um, okay. and so Eretz, you know, obviously in, in Judea, Samaria. He also asked if the Bedouin are receiving money from the new Israel fund and the European U Union, as happens, you know, with the, the building in Area C. Um, the New Israel Fund funds all of the far left organizations that support this Bedouin narrative of indigeneity and um, of the, the abuse of their, quote unquote, God given rights to all of the Negev. Um, they've created this narrative. They represented them in the United Nations when they were first uh, in the when the wave, uh, the popularity of this whole indigenous movement came around. So for all of those of you who may or may not know it, the only people who are considered indigenous to Israel by the United Nations at this point are the Bedouin, who are the least indigenous of all. They've only been in the area and their tribal names uh, are very, very clear about where they come from. And they are proud of their roots in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, so it's also, it, it's kind of laughable. The United, the European Union thus far is far too busy in Judea and Samaria and does not necessarily, and does not involve itself in Israel proper because uh, I, I don't know uh, at this, how long that will last, but that's the situation right now. But the new Israel fund, but all the George Soros satellites Right. are extremely active there and um, represent Bedouin claims in court and um, tear down and delegitimize Israel's uh, legal process for coming to any sort of peaceful resolution and are pushing the Bedouin not to accept any compromise, not to move forward uh, and not to cooperate. So that's their involvement. And it's it's very, very heavy involvement, unfortunately. In Judea and Samaria and Area C, things look very different. And there's far more foreign money being poured into Judea and Samaria for a far smaller population. Uh, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, I would just mention briefly that no one really knows what the Arab population of Area C is. Uh, and anyone who would like to talk about that um, we will be 
launching a, a webinar series, a, a Rigavim webinar series beginning next week. There'll be hopefully periodic webinars that discuss issues in the news, and this is one of them. Um, all sorts of things that you read about in the American press and cannot for the life of you figure out. So we'd like to give some of the background to some of these things. And this is exactly the same sort of twisting of narrative that we see in the in the Negev all the time. And quite a lot of it is addressed in Bedouistan. Uh, you can see how the Negev, how the, the narrative, the false narratives are propagated. And hopefully by the time you finish reading Bedouistan, you won't be fooled anymore. Well, thank you. Um, did, did you want to say anything about the supervised um, ah, you know, yes. supervision of women? So, um, although you may have an idyllic picture in your head of what a polygamous family looks like with sister wives, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, what happens, uh, the biggest opponents of the practice of polygamy in the Bedouin sector happen to be Bedouin women, Israeli Bedouin women, because when their Israeli Bedouin husbands go and take a second wife, it's generally someone who is very, very often someone who's completely illegally underage, but a younger version, uh, someone they have to pay a very, very small dowry for. In other words, the buying price is very small because they come in from underprivileged areas in Gaza and in areas in the Palestinian Authority control. Uh, and the first wife is abandoned, often physically kicked out of the house into a, a shed or a shack out uh, on the property or into one of these, you know, illegal squatters, tents or shacks that they put up on the side of the road. And the new wife is moved into the house. The first wife knows that her fortunes are going to be very, very negatively impacted by all of this. They are, uh, and if they dare to complain, they are very, very often victims of abuse. When a woman manages to get herself to Soraka Hospital or to any of the authorities and social workers, et cetera, et cetera, it, the state of Israel very, very often helps them to relocate uh, anonymously uh, into a Bedouin community in the north of the country because they cannot, the, the situation there is completely different. But a Bedouin woman, a married Bedouin woman with children on her own, uh, divorced from the tribe, um, is it's a not it's not a good fate. Uh, so the state of Israel has uh, taken responsibility and uh, assists these women, but they uh, to have in in far 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 too many cases are victims of hair raising abuse, um, certainly of neglect, and that is why their children are so off the grid, and disenfranchised, and um, simply angry, and turn to a life of crime because they the situation is not it's not a normal one it's not a family in any way that we can recognize uh, okay. we have mm -hmm. I, I apologize mm -hmm. one of the things that we agitated for uh for years and finally achieved was believe it or not the Bituach Lumi, the Israel's uh, National Insurance Institute that hands out all of these stipends had no Arabic speaking investigators or staff members in the Be'er Sheva field office and had no vehicles that were capable of driving off in off-road conditions into these squatters camps. So could not investigate when there were suspicions of spousal abuse or abuse of children or all sorts of other things that were going on. We agitated for a very long time. And finally, finally, the National Insurance Institute has hired Arabic speaking and female investigators. So you don't have a lot of these problems of having them to be accompanied uh, and made sure that they were mobile enough to go out on site and see what's really going on. So we're hoping that some progress will be made in that field as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had a thank you from An uh, uh, Andrea Spindel. Thank you. Thank thanking you. And also saying that there's breaking news. There was another attack. I guess this must be near Huara, two people injured. I, um, and uh, anyway, um, I actually had one more question. I know we're over time, but if you don't mind, I had one, one question I wanted to ask. Um, I did a number of interviews of people about their experiences in 1948, you know, who were there at the time. And he sort of drew me a map and, and showed me about, you know, about the siege of Jerusalem and the battles in Jerusalem. And then he, he mentioned that one of the reasons why Israel was not able to um, 
keep the Jewish quarter and, and um, the eastern portion of Jerusalem is because a decision, I guess Ben-Gurion made the decision that it was, they had limited troops and they had to make a choice uh, between protecting that or trying to battle with that, which would have been a you know a tough battle to win that, and, and moving the troops south to the Negev um, to, um, to make sure that the Negev didn't fall. Um, and, and I guess to meet the Egyptian troops there. And, and I guess the feeling was that was even more strategic. And I'm wondering if if that's something that you're aware of. I mean, that's the only time I had ever heard of that. If if, if you're aware of that, aware. and also what what is the reasoning why 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 the um, negative is so critical from a defense standpoint? Although of course Jerusalem is too. Uh, Jerusalem is too. Um, we are aware of it. As a matter of fact, in almost every one of our reports on the negative, we begin with a quote from Ben Gurion, one or another. He had much, much, much to say about the Negev. It's not a just a, a quaint thing that he built his uh, his home in, in Stable Care, uh, why we called our initiative, our policy initiative, the Stable Care Initiative. Uh, ben Gurion had a very, very clear vision, first of all, that if the Negev falls, if the Negev is not protected, the state of Israel will be overrun. Um, and it's And he wasn't wrong. Uh, there, Israel is not defensible without the Negev, certainly um, not then, and I think similarly not now. Unfortunately, there are many other areas of Israel that you can say the exact same thing about, um, Judea and Samaria as well. Without Judea and Samaria, Israel has no defensible uh, borders, certainly without the Jordan Valley, um, without the South, South Hebron belt that comes up from the Negev and connects to Judea and Samaria, Israel's very small. Israel's a very small place. I actually took, uh, uh, I led a field tour yesterday for a representative of an extreme leftist organization uh, funded, founded and funded by George Soros himself. Uh, and I took him out to Gush Etzion and we stood at Neve Daniel and we saw Arad, we saw the ocean by Bat Yam, and we saw Jordan just past the Herodian, all from one spot. And that's not even Israel's narrowest point, far from it. So yes, it's all one piece. Uh, it always has been, and it always has to be, which is why our call to save the Negev, uh, I think, is completely um, consistent with Ben-Gurion's vision that without the Negev, Israel has no future. And the time to reclaim that future is right now. Well, thank you so much for your excellent presentation. Um, really wonderful. Um, and uh, we will be resuming book club you know, after the holidays. So I want to wish everybody happy holidays. Shana Tova um, thank, thank you for joining us today. And uh, Alan, did you have any final words? No, just Shana Tova to everybody. Naomi, Hatzlacha to you and your group. And uh, let's stay in touch. And thank, thank you, so, you much so much for everything and for everything that you do, Naomi. We really thank appreciate you so much. it. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you. This is a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank so you. Nice